you're listening to the Psychopharmacology Institute podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Wagdan Rashad, and this is a show that aims to help you, the mental health clinician, stay sharp on Psychopharm. We hope you are in good health and spirits, psych heroes. Today, our episode is a continuation of the discussion on psychopharmacology during the perinatal period. We have with us Dr. Vivian Burt to address questions about antidepressant use during pregnancy and neonatal complications, cardiac malformations, and autism. Dr. Burt is a professor of psychiatry at the David Geffen UCLA Medical Center and also the director of the Women's Life Center at the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital. Before we jump to the recommendations of when and how to use antidepressants in pregnancy safely, I think an important disclaimer is needed here. Studies that look at the safety of antidepressants in pregnancy have their limitations that we must be aware of. Dr. Burt points some of them out. Remember, if you will, when we look at studies on the safety of antidepressants in pregnancy, first of all, they are confounded by indication. In other words, Most of the studies don't distinguish between effective medication on infant outcome and maternal illness. Studies tend to be confounded by ascertainment bias. This happens when the results of a study are biased or skewed due to factors that were not accounted for, for example, poor or imperfect data collection, non-random sampling, things like that. Number three, Studies are problematic because they are uncontrolled by associated behaviors such as smoking, drinking, drugs, poor nutrition, poor hygiene, non-compliance with perinatal visits and direction, use of non-prescribed and non-disclosed medications, and also by issues of power. Many of the studies are small, have small numbers of subjects. Also, there are problems with subgroup analyses, beginning with a larger group of SSRI-exposed pregnancies, making conclusions about SSRIs as a large group, and then teasing apart effects of various SSRI antidepressants, even though when doing so, the numbers get smaller and smaller, and conclusions are therefore not statistically valid. Okay, so we have confounding by indication, confounding by ascertainment bias, uncontrolled associated behaviors, a small number of subjects, and problems with subgroup analyses. This could be mind-boggling. Why is it important to have it in mind? So the challenge is to present the information we get from reading complex, confusing, and often confounded literature to our patients. Remember, our patients get their information from the internet, from TV shows, from radio which is often alarming and inaccurate. Our job is to help our patients distinguish between supposed risks, which are based on data, which needs to be carefully understood in the context of problems inherent in doing studies with pregnant patients. Gotcha. So by being aware of these limitations, we can read, interpret, and communicate such studies more critically and hopefully more constructively with our patients. We have a prominent example here about antidepressants and autism spectrum disorder, also referred to as ASD here. Dr. Burt elaborates. Some years ago, there were three case control studies, one at Kaiser in Northern California, one in Sweden, and one in the state of California called the CHARGE study. All of these were case control studies, tried to control for a number of confounders, And they suggested possible association between antidepressant use in pregnancy and ASD. The Kaiser study found an association only with SSRIs. The Swedish study, an association with other antidepressants as well. And the California CHARGE study, association with SSRIs for ASD and possibly developmental delay in boys. None of these studies suggested that this was enough to explain the huge rise in ASD since the 1980s, and all of them had major problems with regard to confounding by indication. Nevertheless, Science News published a picture of a little boy with a cute little diaper on, and the headline, SSRI use during pregnancy linked to autism and developmental delay in boys. Of course, this caused alarm in mothers and fathers throughout the country, throughout the world. If this were true, this would be a major concern. Oh dear. So this is quite alarming indeed. However, just in time, a Danish study came up with results that challenged this. 
it looked at data for more than half a million children born between 1996 and 2006, looking at nearly 9,000 prenatal exposures to SSRIs with over 6,000 with maternal affective histories. And what they found was with prenatal SSRI exposure, there was a 2% risk of autism as opposed to 1.5% without SSRIs. Now, if the data was restricted to children of mothers with prenatal affective disorders, there was no statistically significant risk in ASD with prenatal SSRI exposure. And comparing siblings with and without ASD, prenatal SSRI exposures was not a significant contributor to ASD risk. So they concluded after confounding factors were controlled for that there was no significant association between prenatal SSRI exposure and ASD in offspring. So after controlling for confounding factors, this risk of ASD was not significant. Why are the results so different though? So what is the problem with the studies with regard to SSRIs in pregnancy and possible autism association? There are, in fact, no randomized controlled studies of antidepressants in pregnancy. Even though there have been attempts to address issues of confounding by indication, there is still a lot of residual confounding from unknown or unmeasured confounds, genetic, behavioral, environmental. Also, numerous studies cover the same population, so databases are not as large as they seem to be. And these studies actually did not always arrive at the same conclusions. And in fact, some of the studies arrived at conclusions that weren't even explainable by their own data or findings. Hmm. So what can we make of this information? Is it risky? Is it not? Dr. Burt reviews a 2017 meta-analysis on prenatal antidepressants and autism. So I'd like to summarize for you the recent meta-analyses of prenatal antidepressants and the risk for autism, as written in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry by Dr. Andrade in 2017, an excellent review. And what he points out is as follows. Some studies have found that exposure to antidepressants in pregnancy in general or with SSRIs is associated with significantly increased risk of ASD. But findings diminished in magnitude and significance when data was adjusted for confounding variables, especially maternal mental illness. Antidepressants were associated with increased risk even when exposure was limited to preconception periods, when drugs could never have possibly affected the fetus. He went on to say that just because antidepressants are associated with an increase in risk for ASD, that doesn't mean that antidepressants are responsible for that risk. If antidepressants do increase the risk for ASD, of course, we need to discuss this with our patients. But we have to remind them to keep in mind that all those studies do not prove antidepressants increase ASD, it's understandable that women are concerned. Although case control studies may identify associations, they often overestimate the magnitude of risk. Note, if you're interested in reading these studies, we have them in the reference section below. All right, so that's antidepressants and autism risk. What about the risk of using antidepressants on other aspects of neonatal outcomes, like cardiac malformations? Let's check it out after the break. Antidepressants and malformations. Dr. Burt begins with a study by Dr. Heli Malm and her group in Finland. This is a case control study, a Finnish study link database with over 600,000 mother-child pairs with exposure determined by recorded first-time SSRI purchases. And what were the findings? Well, first of all, women who purchased SSRIs were less likely to be married more likely to smoke, to have chronic diseases, to use non-SSRI psychotropics and non-psychotropics. Let's get to the results. SSRIs as a group and individually, there was no significant increase in risk for overall major malformations. However, fluoxetine was found to increase the risk for ventricular septal defect, a V's SD, twofold. 
and paroxetine increased the risk for right ventricular outflow tract defects, RVOT, fivefold. And citalopram increased neural tract defects two and a half fold. So those are concerning. However, notice also that the risk of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders was 10 times higher in SSRI exposed cases. So this suggests underlying psychiatric conditions, which were responsible for both SSRI and alcohol use, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. The study suggests confounding by indication with depression may have predisposed to adverse outcomes rather than SSRIs themselves. Hmm. So how should the study have been done to prevent the confounding with alcohol-related issues? What we needed were randomized controlled data where depressed women were randomized to SSRI or placebo, but this can never be done. It is unethical in pregnancy to withhold medication from disabled depressed women. This is the problem with case-controlled data-based linked studies. Ah, so that makes sense. In the presentation Dr. Burke gave, she reviewed other studies about this. And if you're interested in checking out the full lecture, please visit psychopharmacologyinstitute.com or check the transcript for the link. Anyhow, what are the take-home messages regarding this? So when we look at SSRI antidepressants and the risk for teratogenicity, a general statement that we can make is that SSRIs, in fact, are the most studied antidepressants in pregnancy. We have well over 33,000 reported published exposures. Overall, SSRI use is not associated with specific morphologic teratogenic risks. And we have to always remember that the background risk for major congenital malformations is 3%. And I should add, the most common of these congenital malformations is cardiac defects. And of those, the most common are VSD or ventricular septal defects, many of which correct themselves over the early infancy months. First of all, with regard to miscarriage. There is no increased risk of miscarriage, and this is a result of large systematic reviews and meta-analyses of pregnancy and delivery outcomes after exposure to antidepressants. There is no increased risk of stillbirth, neonatal mortality, post-neonatal mortality with antenatal SSRIs. SSRIs and untreated maternal depression do not cause clinically significant lower birth weight. And there is a small, statistically significant, but probably not clinically significant reduction in the length of gestation of about three days with antidepressants and or depression exposure in pregnancy. So according to this, the length of gestation might be reduced with prenatal antidepressant use. What about neonatal adaptive difficulties? We discussed this in the previous perinatal depression episode, but it would do no harm to revisit. Now let's move on to talk about something that I do see, and that is what we call neonatal adaptive difficulties. And this occurs in about 15 to 30 percent of cases where there has been exposure in the third trimester to antidepressants, particularly serotonergic antidepressants. And what we see sometimes is transient perinatal adverse events, things like jitteriness, poor muscle tone, weak cry, respiratory distress, sometimes hypoglycemia, difficulty feeding, and very rarely seizure. This is usually mild, temporary, dissipates, it says within two weeks, but really generally within hours. What we recommend is that infants exposed to antidepressants ought to be monitored after birth for 48 hours for additional care as needed. Interestingly enough, prospective follow-up of affective infants who have had these transient perinatal adverse events What we've seen is that there has been no change, no difference from controls on intelligence, aberrant behaviors, depression, or anxiety, even at ages up to age four or five. Let's talk about one other issue that is of some concern, and that is persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, PPHN. That was thought to be possibly associated with SSRI use in the last trimester. It can occur even with no exposure to anything, 
But in 2011, the FDA updated their statement on the internet to say that after reviewing different studies, quote, it is premature to reach any conclusion about a possible link between SSRI use in pregnancy and PPHN. They recommended that healthcare professionals not alter their current clinical practice of treating depression during pregnancy. And in fact, in JAMA of 2015, Hubrecht published a study, a large Medicaid cohort study, suggesting that although there may be a possible increased risk of PPHM, the absolute risk with SSRIs in pregnancy is very small, with the adjusted risk being 1.28, with a confidence interval of between 1.01 and 1.64. For non-SSRIs, the adjusted risk was not significant. So in summary, we should keep in mind the possibility of PPHN occurring. The risk doesn't seem to be significant enough to prevent prescribing a pregnant and depressed patient an antidepressant. Finally, let's see what the evidence is for the association between antidepressants and IQ of the offspring. So when we look at long-term neurobehavioral studies, we note that there has been no effect of antidepressants on IQ or behavioral outcomes. Untreated depression has been associated with an increased risk for postpartum depression, and prenatal and postnatal depression has been associated with behavioral problems in the offspring and possible increased risk for long-term psychopathology, as you noted from the Myrna Weissman studies and from other studies as well. It seems that untreated depression during pregnancy can do much more harm than we thought. Our pregnant patients with depression need all the care they can get for them and for the sake of their offspring too. And that's about it for today's podcast. We hope you learned something new today. Now, listen up for the key points. Studies on the safety of antidepressants in pregnancy can be limited by confounding by indication, confounding by ascertainment bias, uncontrolled associative behaviors, and a small number of subjects. Results are mixed regarding SSRI use and autism risk. After adjusting for confounding factors, antidepressants do not carry a significantly increased risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, or neonatal mortality. SSRI use has been found to be linked to transient neonatal adaptive difficulties. SSRI use in the last trimester has been associated with pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Did you know that a lot of today's content was extracted from our CME presentation entitled Perinatal Psychiatry, Helping Patients Make Decisions About Psychotropic Drugs in Pregnancy? Check it out on our website. Visit piupdates.com and become a premium member already. We have a bunch of CMEs and essay credits for you to collect. If you are a premium or a premium plus member and you refer a friend to join our platform, you will receive a $50 Amazon gift card. The following people participated in this episode. Dr. Flavio Guzman as a general editor, Andy Rode as the audio engineer, Pamela Gonzalez as the project manager, and myself, Dr. Wegda and Rashad as the host. We'd also like to thank Dr. Vivian Burt for being with us. Thank you for joining us in today's podcast. Until the next episode, goodbye. Goodbye.